A very good morning on this beautiful, very beautiful uh, February 28th, Sunday morning. We have with us the lovely, if not a little beat up, Michelle Avanti, <laughs> who gave the talk this week in a, in, in a reprise of, uh, of last year's discussion on the same topic. Um, so we are very grateful that you're here, Michelle. Thank you for coming. Um, well, I guess uh, Bob, Bob wanted to go first. A very quickie. When we speak, we want to uh, be attentive, give a fair shake, accept. I have a terrible problem with that, with what I know to be a robocall. <laughs> I get a robocall and this person's giving their spiel, sometimes I'll just say no, and I, I, I'm involved in it, I'm really pissed. They're invading my privacy, and a lot of times I just hang up right there. And I know Lois does the same, and I think hundreds of other people do. Uh, I don't know how to get around it, but uh, to go through, is it true? Well, I don't give a flat test about whether it's true or not. Is this necessary? Uh, no, so it isn't necessary. So I exit there, but I don't feel good about it. Bob, <clears throat> when we say, is it true, is it necessary, and is it kind? <laughs> kind comes into play here. <laughs> so, and I don't know, give a rats about that either with this robocall person. Well, but, but they're know, trying to make a buck. Well, you know what? It, it's the way I look at it is, is the same way when people come to my door, okay, and yes. they're selling religion. <laughs> I always say to them, you know, I understand that you're, you're doing what you believe is really good and really important. And on the robocall, I just tell them, well, you know what, I know you're doing your job, but this is not for me. Thank you. And then I just hang up. Uh, I find that if we can just be kind, the key is to be kind, to remember it's a human being you're talking to. It's not the corporation. It's not the CEO. It's not the guy who's getting the bottom line. That's it's right. the person who's making a few bucks. <laughs> They're just, they have a job, you know, and the people who come to our door, I, I used to have a friend, which she would say to a Jehovah Witness was terrifying to me. <laughs> She'd say, well, I love Satan. So please, if come in, <laughs> and they would go running. <laughs> but okay. I don't think that's kind either. So, um, you know. Okay, thank you for the, the uh, explanation, the counseling. It's a great sermon, yeah. even though it's a replay. <laughs> uh, Lurley wanted to go next. Oh, I, I don't know where to start. Uh, as far as the uh, robocalls go, uh, I have to refer to a friend of mine that uh, she put on her answering machine. Uh, Hi, you've reached Laura and uh, Laura. Uh, uh, oh, can't think of her last name. Anyway, that uh, she says, uh, I am so excited to have your call come in. If you would please leave your name and, and phone number so I can get back with you and spend all the money I can on your product and <laughs> it was a riot oh shoot but anyway uh, uh, I wanted to thank uh, Michelle uh, it was a very interesting uh, I I don't remember the first time that she was but uh, I don't know I was probably busy uh, putting out uh, snacks but anyway <clears throat> uh, it was very very interesting. I uh, couldn't help but relate uh, that uh, so many times uh, friends and family have good intentions uh, towards you, uh, well, say towards me, and uh, not knowing really uh, my feelings. You, you know, it's very difficult to, you don't want to hurt their feelings. You don't want to, um, uh, you know, cause any hard feelings. Uh, and so in the past, I've just, uh, you know, 
basically get my mouth shut. And uh, this was this was very interesting, and I appreciated the the info on it. Thank you, Michelle. Oh, you're welcome. I think it's hard for us sometimes to know what to do, especially with family, because um, there are so many interconnections over years in family, and you want so much to show them that you love them, even if they're not showing you love. And it's, it's very challenging. You know, I had family members, they've all changed at this point, but when I was in my 20s, they used to laugh at who I was, literally laugh at me. They would sit at the table and I'd be in the room and they would talk about me as if I wasn't in the room. Yeah. <laughs> and they'd laugh about who I was. And um, that's very cruel. It's a yeah, cruel thing is. to do to anyone. Even if you don't know them, it's cruel. Mm -hmm. But uh, you have to just bless it. And, you know, I, I would go back to, you know, the statement that Christ said on the cross, you know, when they were stabbing him, or uh, that is alleged to have said what he said, you know, bless them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing. You know, they're, they're being very unkind to you or they're misled. And in this day and age with so many people, we have a, a portion of our country right now completely absorbed with misinformation and, and conspiracy theories. And, and, and they absolutely believe them as if they were absolute truth. There's no way anyone's going to convince them otherwise. Um, I recently saw one, I don't know, I was flipping channels <laughs> and I caught An Cooper Anderson, Anderson Cooper speaking to someone who was a QAnon person. And, uh, and he was saying to them, you actually believe that I ate the blood of children? Mm. And, and I, I, I stopped and watched this for a minute because I thought, what is that man going to say to him? <laughs> and he said, yes. He said, I absolutely believed it. And I thought, you know, this is why you, you, can't, um, you can't convince the people you have to just bless them, bless them. You know, uh, I always have a saying, it's an ancient Egyptian saying, um, it is Baraka Bashad. It means may the blessings pour down upon this space. May the light come into this space, may wisdom be found. And I find that if you say that enough in any area and you're saying it from your heart, Spirit has a way of opening doors. It may take years, but eventually, like the Grand Canyon, it opens up. So, you and, know, just you have to do your best to recognize that they're in a different place. Yeah, and, and this is what I have done. Uh, I got emails from my sister-in-law uh, and she ver fervently believes, I don't know where she's getting her information, but, uh, uh, Number one, she didn't believe, she believed that uh, Sandy Hook was a uh, uh, false thing. And, oh, and the links that she sent or the information she sent to me was uh, that uh, the COVID uh, uh, vaccines were a farce, that they were uh, going to kill us all, that there was, uh, you know, I don't know, she went on and on and I... It seems like, like, you know, the misinformation or disinformation, you know, exists in, in droves. Um, Michelle, what I would be curious, yeah. and then we'll get to Julianne, um, is for me, I, I find honesty very, very easy with people I don't like. It's the people I love that I have the yes. hardest time being honest with because the people you love, we don't want to hurt them. And on, and, and often honesty is hurtful. Yeah. You know, I, I believe that honesty is the most important thing, but that doesn't mean you can't apply it in a way that's kind. <laughs> to be honest and unkind does actually root out your speech. <laughs> it's like, I don't need to say anything just because she asked me, about this stress, <laughs> you know, but I find there are, if you ask spirit to give you guidance, I find they give me guidance and they'll find a way for me to say what I need to say without saying it 
in any way that's that's unkind hmm. you know my sister would drive me insane asking me how do i look in this dress and i would say you look great and then she'd go change clothes and she'd come back and say i know you didn't believe that so how do i look in this dress?" <laughs> and this would go on for like an hour <laughs> she would make me want to pull my hair out <laughs> uh, but you know i was always honest they she did look good. I mean, she looks like a model in anything she puts on. So, but, you know, if she had put something on that I didn't like, or I thought looked awful on her, I would certainly say, you know, Anne, you looked better in the last dress. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say you look awful in it because that's unkind, <laughs> you know? So I, I don't know. I find, I ask Spirit for help in those areas. Um, my biggest challenge is when I'm face to face with something that is really, really angering, which makes me angry. That's where I have my biggest challenge asking spirit for guidance, because when I get, if I get angry and it's very rare that I get really angry, um, then I am blocking. And that's what we do when we get angry. We literally block our ability to hear what spirit has to say. Hmm. So uh, I, I was at a protest, um, a woman's march. It's probably over, it's easily over a year ago because we haven't done anything. And, um, and I was with my group of uh, veterans for peace and uh, a, guy, a whole group of people came in from Medford carrying these enormous banners. If anybody was there, you'll remember this with images of babies being murdered, fetuses being killed. It was, it was so disgusting. And if you've ever lost a child to see something like that tears your heart out. And I buried a little baby. So it was not easy for me. And this man, one of them decided they would stand right next to me, right next to me in our group. <laughs> And I can't remember what I said to him, but I know I was not kind. <laughs> I was honest. <laughs> I was brutally honest. And, uh, and I did ask him a number of times to please choose a different spot. But um, I was angry. Yeah. Uh, Julianne wanted to go next. Um, I'm probably backtracking, but um, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not known for for mincing words <laughs> if, you if, if the, if the <laughs> thought yeah. runs through my brain i i just don't have a mouth governor sometimes um <laughs> however i i don't think your principles michelle will apply to toxic familial relationships and there are many um the effort is one-sided and perhaps <clears throat> it will generate goodwill eventually, but it's not going to be an immediate transformation, that's for sure. And the second thing I'd like to point out is my, my tactic for telemarketers. And mostly they're, the ones I get are, are taped. <clears throat> and so I text back, die, slime, die. <laughs> and amazingly, amazingly, there's there's several people that have re responded and they said, really, you don't want to get these calls? I'm like, God, kidding? <laughs> Bye. <laughs> oh, my God. <clears throat> so much worth a try. <clears throat> Uh, you know, if you're if you're working with a robot, I'm not sure that it really matters if it's true, necessary, or kind. Right? They're not, they're not human. Right. Uh, and they're not an animal. They're not a living organism. So I'm I'm not going to apply those necessarily to a robot. <laughs> but um, it's good practice, even with a robot. You know, there will be a time in the future where people are going to feel familiarity with robots. <laughs> so. That time will come. It's happening even as we speak. Well, that, any chat box, any any utility or anything you buy has a, a chat that's AI. So, yes, yeah. interesting. Um, so just just a, a quick heads up, because there's a lot of people in here, the more people that's in here, the smaller you all get. So um, so if you want to say something, either type it into the text box or the chat or 
wave your hands largely because I can't tell if you're just making a gesture or if you want to actually speak. Um, I think but, Anne has something to say. Yes. <laughs> Um, and and yeah, that that's the size of a postage stamp on my screen. So I don't think anybody's seeing that. You'll you'll have to hold it up longer. Uh, go ahead, Martha. <laughs> I was re uh, responding to a few threads ago. Um, I took some notes when I was uh, listening to the service. You know, dealing with family members over time, and when you have a very critical parent, either inside your head and outside your head. It was helpful to me, this one phrase was stop looking outside yourself for the answer. Use your best connected to your heart and um, slow down, show love. Uh, and it's usually uh, the other's fear of juggling choices as in someone's, it, it, it's putting their insecurities on you to solve their problem. And I felt that a lot with my family. The, when I became, uh, I guess, different when I went away to school and came home with some ideas that were different. So I'll just leave it there. But I think the, the issue is stop looking outside for yourself. Go inside, feel your inside, your heart, your gut. And that's, that's sort of try to be my guide. That is so, it's so right on. I mean, our heart, our heart can tell us what we should say. Our brain responds with all kinds of information based on all kinds of information. It's not a central source. Our brain is great. Obviously, it's great to have a brain, <laughs> but it, it, our brain remembers all the things that person may have said to us in the past. And if we're in the wrong mood, we could just slap them. <laughs> You know, I don't mean slap them physically, but with words. And yep. words can be much worse than an actual physical slap. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that's where I say, you know, take a deep breath before you start speaking. You know, I, I always do take a deep breath, even when I was speaking to that man at that protest. <laughs> but it just got me so hard that I just wanted him to go away. But with family... I find that, you know, if you take a deep breath, you can say, okay, I can work with this. I love this person. And when someone is trying very hard to tell me to do something that I know is not me, it's not me, it's not right, it's not right for me, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I will take a deep breath and then I will say to them, you know, I really honor the fact that you want me to do something that you feel is absolutely best for me, mm -hmm. but it's not me. So thank you for giving me that gift, but let's not go down this road again. Yeah. I love you. I'll always love you, but we're different. I need a different path. Yeah. And that's pretty much the way I've put it with a lot of people over my lifetime, because I certainly have had family members who have <laughs> thought I was off the charts weird. I, I have to say that it took them maybe 35 years, but over that 35 years, all of them have come along. So I'm very fortunate. I'm a very, very fortunate person. Uh, but uh, we still have differences. <laughs> you know, I still have a brother who is like a QAnon person. So we just don't go there. We have an agreement not to go there. Um, but we talk about everything else and everything else works. Uh, Laleen wanted to go next. Hmm? I, I had uh, family on my mind to Michelle and um, a couple things. I'm reminded that as we're growing up, you know, one of the things that parents need to do with their children is the, the notion of let go, let grow. And then as we children move into our own adulthood, um, you brought up to me something that's always been kind of like a saving way of looking at my world. And that's the idea that the people in our world are inside of um, different degrees from me and the center. Mm -hmm. And what I've come to do in my world is 
in my innermost center, which means closest to me, are only the people that I know, no matter what, they're in my corner. You know, I feel totally safe. I feel loved and, and I love and could share anything with them. And that may or may not be family. And then the next circle out for me is close relationships, which hopefully can become family. But again, depending on the toxicity of relationships, it might not be. But close relationships are, are also people you share with. But what's missing is that degree of safety. And then you get out there to friends, good friends, friends, and then acquaintances, and then everybody in the world you don't know. And I just think it's important, and it always has been for me, to have that degree of spacing, because people don't always stay in the same place. For example, when I came out as a lesbian many years ago, there were a few people that I felt were safe and in my corner and turned out not to be. Or you get pregnant and you know, you're not married and that interrupts someone the wrong way. There are so many reasons why relationships can change because of who knows what. So having that flexibility to me has always been important. No, I, I, I don't think that I always want to remember is a degree of safety. The degree of safety is so important because that's when you know you can truly speak your heart's brain no matter what the topic is. Yeah, that, you know, having people and that are really, really close, people who really have your confidence, that's so important. And, and everybody should have people like that in their world where you can say whatever you need to say. You know, I, I always tell my close friends, you know, it's okay. You can tell me that something's hanging out. You can tell me I have bad breath. You can tell me anything because it's not going to make me upset with you. It's going to make me correct something about me. And it's how we take it. And when we have friends who understand that we can be completely transparent with them, they're in our inner circle. Those are intimate. And when I say family, I mean people who are close, not necessarily blood, you know, uh, blood family isn't always family that way. You can't always be transparent. There, I, I have a zillion clients who, you know, have a problem speaking to their family. You know, years ago, I had a, um, a client who uh, came to me and, and she was having problems with her mother. She had bad problems with her mother her whole life. Her mother would come into her house and she had a collection of dolls that she kept around the house. And her mother would come in and change the collection every time she'd come in the house. She would move the dolls and put them in different places. And it made her crazy. And I said to her, so why are you accepting that? And she said, well, it's my mom. And she's always done stuff like that. I says, well, it's your world. Why do you choose to allow your mom to disrupt your world? And what she ended up doing was learning that she could actually say to her mom, please don't touch my dolls. I have them exactly where I want them. You know, when I come to your house, I won't change anything. When you come to mine, please speak to me. We'll talk about it, but don't move my dolls. And you know, that woman was on um, a breathing machine when I met her where she did not get enough oxygen. And that is usually a sign that the individual is not speaking up. It didn't take very long after she started to put her foot down with her mother that that changed and she didn't need that anymore. She didn't stop dragging a tank around. We have wow. this incredible ability to change our lives when we recognize that we are the ones in power in our universe. What that woman was doing was she took the center of her universe and put her mother in it. And her universe was collapsing with oxygen first. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, let's see, we've got, we've got an open forum now. Uh, it'd be nice to hear from somebody who hasn't spoken yet. I would do that. Okay, go ahead, Connie. 
Am I unmuted or? You are unmuted and oh, loud and clear. I was being so quiet. Yeah. Um, I wanted to um, say something about one of the lines in Michelle's service was about people in our life change. And that really triggered in me um, lots of things uh, about communicating um, things that used to be difficult. And for example, if you're a grandparent and, at, and your grandkids grow up, it's time to treat them as an adult, <laughs> you know? And, and then also sometimes if your parent lives a long time, they want to be nurtured. You know, your role changes with them. And so I really think I'm going to spend a lot of time thinking about that people in our life changing and thinking about adjusting how I communicate with that person because their life has changed and mine will too. Yeah. You know, um, one of the things that I come across a lot when I'm working with clients is they reach a point that I call a plateau. We all do this. As we go through life, we have a variety of plateaus we reach. And when we come to this plateau, I call it the plateau of self-honesty. It's where we come into this space and we need to re-examine who we are because we're no longer that person that has been saying yes to this person and yes to that person for a long time. And it's time now that we realize, you know what? I don't really want to do that anymore. You know, you have a friend who calls you and says, I want to go shopping and with you or come shopping with me. And, and you always say yes. And, and you reach this point of self-honesty where you say, you know what? I used to like doing that. I don't like doing that anymore. So you need to become honest first with yourself about what you want in your life and who you are now and how you've changed. And then look out into your world and say, okay, how do I work with everyone in my life based on who I am now. That seems to be a, a huge issue for a lot of people because we get stuck in a habit of saying yes to things we don't really want to say yes to. It doesn't mean you didn't want to say yes once upon a time, but who you are now no longer wants to say yes to that. Mm. And I'm into thing. that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so so I, I call that plateaus of self-honesty. And I think we do that too when we look out and we say, you know, my nephew isn't that little boy that I used to give yeah. all the information to anymore. Now he's a young man who has all this information to give me and I need to learn to listen <laughs> and not interrupt him when he's talking because he has a lot to give. <laughs> so yeah, we change and we need to be really honest about how we've changed. Mm. So what advice would you give to somebody who says, I'm stuck, I'm stuck in the eyes of the people that I love um, in, it, they see me as the person I used to be and not the person now. You know, I think the, the best thing you can do is continue to speak to them, you know, and to love them. And perhaps to bring some of that truth in because maybe they're really missing it. So it's transparency again, saying to them, you know, I appreciate that you have all this love for me in the way I used to be. Could you open up that door and maybe see who I am now? And let's work from where I am now. Create a bridge that's not there, you know, because that's what you're basically saying when, when family no longer recognizes you as who you are now you have to create some kind of bridge to them because they don't understand that they need to create a bridge. We need these things. And in family, it can be very challenging because, you know, a mom will always see you as that little boy. <laughs> but at some point, she's going to have to say, wait a minute, he's got a lot of wisdom to give. I know I see this with my nephews. I marvel, literally marvel at their wisdom because they have so much to give. And uh, sometimes, of course, they'll call me for guidance and I'll give them what I have. But invariably what I've learned to do is to say, so what is it that you really think? What is it that you really feel? Because when you do that, then they have the experience of knowing 
rather than using the information you would give them. You know, every one of us has a world of tremendous wisdom because every one of us is a divine being. So if we can just say, you know what, you can look inside and give it to me and encourage them to do that, it opens the doorway and it creates a new bridge. Great. Okay. Um, who's, who's next? Sorry, I'm getting, I, I, I've gotten more text messages. Yeah, uh, Sharon. So I'm not it, tr trying to ignore anybody, but there's so many text messages coming in today. Uh, Sharon, I've asked you to unmute. There you go. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry I was late. I had some technical difficulties. I would like to thank you, Michelle, for three main things that I needed to hear again. Was that about lying to myself and that the heart knows love, it only knows love. And I have an illustration from this past week. <clears throat> I was speaking with my friend Rick Zemlin and we were talking about the passing of his friend, Deanna Ortiz. Deanna was a nun who had been a teacher in Guatemala where she was kidnapped and tortured by the drug cartel in Guatemala in the 1990s. The Washington Post wrote an article describing her torture and it was hard for me to read again at, you know, 20 years past. Fortunately, Diana was able to escape and she returned to the United States severely traumatized. And then she again was traumatized by the US government officials who disbelieved the story she had lived. It took her some years to rebalance herself from the brutality she had experienced, but she was living in a spiritual community in Washington, DC, which is where Rick also had lived. Deanna was surrounded by compassion, kindness, and love. And Rick witnessed her healing as she came out of her hurt and withdrawn self. Eventually, she began advocacy work for other victims of torture, and Rick helped with that effort. And I felt like that was a perfect illustration of what you were saying, that the heart only knows love. So, thank you. Yeah, that's what you described too, you know, I think about the challenges that we as soul choose to experience when we come into physicality. You know, you can look out in the world and see something that you find horrific and you say, why? You have to be careful when you say, why? How deeply are you asking that? Because we set in motion the opportunity to experience because we have asked why. So there are things that we don't realize we do karmically and invariably when we ask why and we come back in another life to experience that torture, that murder, that dungeon, whatever it is, because there have been so many kinds of destructive experiences that are part of uh, the human experience on planet earth. We come back to experience it and then we move it forward through a healing process mm -hmm. so that we can help others who are experiencing it. Mm -hmm. We always come out on the other side. Some people take a couple of lifetimes to get to the other side but someone like the woman you described who was filled with love to begin with manages through it in one lifetime. And then they are able to uplift other human beings. I am a coward. I admit that openly. Courageous in some ways and a total coward in others. <laughs> I always ask spirit to show me the way and let me skate across. Help me to understand through others' experiences so that I don't have to personally go through the torture, the bullets, the dungeon 
that others are going through. So I consider myself a coward. Of course, in other lifetimes, I've experienced things. <laughs> and actually, in this lifetime, as a result of uh, clients that I've had, uh, I remember one so clearly, it's beyond imagination, uh, one from a past life experience where I helped them through a past life experience. I found myself in a dungeon, being born in a dungeon and living in a dungeon to the age of 12 in France, and then it released from that dungeon. And to this moment, I can still feel what it was like to be outside for the first time in a lifetime, 12 years old, greenery and air. And it was magnificent beyond anything you can imagine. And here, all of us in this lifetime have always had these things. We are amazing beings with so many experiences. You can integrate anything if you choose to. So be careful how you say you want to experience things because you open a karmic thread that can be create a lifetime that is challenging for you. And oh my God, heartbreaking for everyone who loves you. So I, and, and what you just said, you know, is something that we've heard echoed from a few other speakers, you know, this idea that we choose our suffering. And you, you, just, just to be a, a quick devil's advocate, I'm curious as to how you would respond to somebody like um, the Uyghur Muslims are a very, very good example. Uh, there have been reports that have come out about the, and I, I, won't, I won't describe the abuse, that okay. these individuals are going through because it is so horrific. Um, and Muslims don't believe in multiple lives. So I don't, what would you say to these women uh, if they came to you and said, now, wait a minute, the idea that you're saying I chose to have this experience when I made no conscious choice whatsoever. This is the only life I get. And I've been brutalized and it's been ruined by the these these people who hold to this this state communist religion um what would you say to them i don't know if i would have good words to say to them michael hmm. my heart breaks for them i know when i was very young okay the spiritual masters that i worked with one of the very first uh lines he gave me to meditate on and to learn was, and remember, I was only like two years old, okay. <laughs> he said, everything wow. is natural. And I remember sitting in front of the TV and seeing children starving in Africa. And I said to the master, everything is natural. How can this be natural? This is horrible. And what I understood was, Michelle, there is individual karma, there is national karma, there is world karma, there is karma at many, many, many levels. And souls come in in groups to experience things that will give a voice to the world to change the state of consciousness of humanity. And those challenges can be beyond horrific. That's what Spear told me. And that's the lens I look through. But for that individual who seems locked in the belief system that there is only one life and that this is all she gets, I don't know that I can really help her except to say, in your heart, there's love. And there are beings who love you. And for her, maybe I would say ancestral beings because those around you are being tortured as well, people that you love. So it's very hard to understand where the love is. But I would say cling to that because I can't release you from the pain and pressure you're in. My heart breaks for each one of them because I agree. I looked at that TV and to this day, thinking little babies starving to death. It's too much for my heart. It breaks my heart. So I don't know more than I can say. 
because I do know we have many, many lives. I know that my experience tells me that, you know, the story that I wrote on Facebook after I fell on my face, uh, <laughs> and I now wear what's left. Um, a few days later, a man called me on the phone out of the blue. I don't know who he is. Um, and he said, and, and I picked up the phone. I said, hello. And he said, do you speak to the dead? And I, I thought, I, I stopped for a minute because I thought, you know, I've been working in this field for my entire life, professionally for over 30 years. And no one, no one has ever asked that question in that set of words. And uh, I did respond to him and I, and I did say very transparently, <laughs> you know, no one's ever asked me that question before. <laughs> and, and then I realized uh, I, I don't think of anyone as dead. I think of them without a physical body, but I don't think of them as dead. And, uh, and it made me go to a space later on, I, I thought more after I got off the phone with him, where I remembered going, because I thought, what if I believe that? How, is there anything in my life that tells me beyond a shadow of a doubt that, that we do have more than one life, that there are other lives? and that we are a continuum. And of course, I've had tons and tons of experiences, but one in particular jumped out at me. I had gone to uh, a friend of mine was holding her first psychic fair and she said, would you please come? And I said, sure, because I love to support my friends. I don't normally do psychic fairs. <laughs> I don't normally do anything out in public. You guys are the most public I am. <laughs> So, but nonetheless, uh, so I did it and I was there at the fair and a bunch of psychics came over to me and said, we're going to be doing a crossing over, come with us. And I says, look, I'll come and support you, but I'm not getting up on any stage. I am not a stage person. I don't have any interest. So I went and I sat all the way in the back. And of course, they did a meditation. They opened the doors of consciousness and, uh, uh, and lines between oh, on, just a second. And within seconds, this little boy with his bicycle came up to me and tapped me on the shoulder. He was not in a physical body. And I can still see him to this day. And I said, I looked at him and he said, would you tell my mom I'm here? And I said, where is your mom? And he pointed to a lady who was, oh, about 50 feet, 40 feet away from me, sitting across the room. So I, I quietly went across the room and, uh, and I tapped her and I said, your son is here and he wants you to know he's here. And she immediately burst into tears and said, I knew he would come. I knew he would come. And I looked at her and I said, did he die with his bicycle? And she said, yes, a car hit him when he was riding his bicycle. I didn't know that lady. I didn't plan on going to this event. <laughs> but when the doors are open, spirit sees where there are doorways and they know which doorways they can use. And I was a doorway, that's all I was to help communicate between worlds that her son was there. Now, if you doubt that there are other lives and that we continue, I want you to think about that because why would I know anything about this woman's life or her child or that he died with his bicycle? Yeah. We definitely go on and I have a gazillion stories about going on, but that one just hit me as a result of this experience where this man called and asked if I speak to the dead. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know any dead people. <laughs> they don't exist. Um, and even though you're not too much of a public person, we are very grateful uh, that you make the time to talk to us. So uh, Laleen wanted to go next. I wanted to kind of continue with a question or two, Michelle, the topic that you're currently on. Um, in my life, I've experienced a lot of past lives, some that I can see the linkage, this is to this is this, and also some 
illnesses related to a past life that enabled me to work through some karma from that. My question. I've been curious now ever since the first time that occurred when I was about 11. How, what, what is it in a, in a life that, that suddenly that becomes a life where one opens and, and is able as I have been to get access to so many past lives and then begin the work on coming to understanding and resolution with that. That's the first part of the question. And the second part, when I traveled with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, she used to have experiences like the one you just described. We'd be in an airport and she, the plane would be late. And I'd be kind of antsy to get home because we'd just done a five day workshop and, and she'd say, it's as it's supposed to be. And then a few minutes later, she'd get up and she would go over and there would be a young couple and she'd talk to them for a half an hour or so and she'd come back and she'd say, now we can go. And it turned out that couple had just lost their son and were grieving and she knew all of that. And, yeah. and when it was done and she came back over and sat down, then they announced that our plane was going to yeah. be leaving and that there was no further need for delay. It's a, big, it's a mystery to me, even though it's happening to me, it's a mystery. Can you? Yeah, you know, when we opened, a few days ago, a friend of mine, uh, one of my clients and also a friend uh, called and uh, she was describing an experience that she had. And she said, you know, I finally have said to spirit, I, I, I want to help children. And she's had all these children coming to her. I said, well, what you do when you say, I choose, and you say this to spirit, you say it in a way that you know from the depths of your heart, this is something you mean. It's not saying, well, I want a chocolate bar. Okay, this is a completely different statement, okay? This is saying, I choose to work with the universe. Yeah. The universe will open doorways. You know, I have a simple saying that I've said my entire life. I ask spirit that I be a vehicle for spirit. Let me be your vehicle this day. And this is a prayer that has been said from ancient times through the present by a variety of pathways. Uh, it's known in the present, I think, as St. Francis's prayer. Um, but I simply say that, and I say it with all my heart, let me be a vehicle for you. Let me be here to answer the questions of those who have questions, whatever they may be. I take no um, direction from me, but rather from you. Let me be your voice. When you do that, you open what I call a vortex, a vortex of energy that opens, and it clears pathways for individuals to come to you, to be there for you to help them. And that is what uh, your friend did. She had a vortex. And when you have a vortex, everything stops for that vortex. Mm -hmm. It's not that you're controlling anything. Spirit is controlling it. And it is perfect. It's absolutely perfect. So you witness that protection. You witness that vortex. You witnessed her giving of her heart. And she was fully aware of it, you know. I remember a morning where spirit woke me up out of my sleep and said, you need to go to the donut shop. And I'm going, what, are you crazy? I don't eat donuts, I don't drink coffee, I don't even do orange juice. What am I gonna do in a donut shop? <laughs> and they said, you need to go to the donut shop. So I got up and my mother happened to be visiting my sister. So I knew my mother would be great cover. She loved donuts, coffee and orange juice. So she was perfect. So I asked her, you want to go to the donut shop? And of course, she thought I was odd, but she said, absolutely, yes. So I took her. And as soon as we sat down, of course, I had nothing. My mom had everything. But uh, we sat down, and uh, there was a man at another table who needed help. And I don't know how we connected. I don't remember that. But I know I helped him. If you say, I will be this vehicle, you open that vortex. Okay, now going back to your first question, 
I can't remember it. Bring it back so I can remember it. <laughs> How is it that once a past life comes, we seem to open up to other past lives that are related to and then some that aren't? And what, what is it that that first life comes through? Because so many people have said to me, I've never had a past life. I can't remember my last life to say, oh, I had some there and now I'm having more. So, I mean, to me, it's just a, this happens and it's amazing. You know, I, I, I used to help people open up to their past lives. Uh, some people uh, will not see them or hear them, even though they're all around us. <laughs> you can't go anywhere without your past lives. They're part of you. <laughs> so, but, you know, what I would tell them, uh, if they, they were wanting to learn that, uh, ask yourself, what am I drawn to and what am I repulsed by? Just ordinary things that have nothing to do with this lifetime. You, you could you could have been born and your mom had traditional furniture and you said, oh, I love this furniture. Or you could have been born and seen this traditional furniture and thought, Ugh, why does mom have this furniture? <laughs> that period has a lot to do with a past life and how you experience that past life. You know, you could look at uh, French uh, outfits from the time of the French Revolution and you could be completely repulsed by the nobility's clothing because you were not nobility in that lifetime but you were present it's around us everywhere and invariably it's those instant responses you have to things that give you a clue as to who you are from past lives what have you brought forward you, you know our allergies can come from past lives <laughs> It's really interesting. We don't go anywhere without them. And uh, it's really, if a person wants to open to them, they can. If your belief system is that if, uh, if there were past lives, then that's baloney and that's bad for you and maybe I'd go to hell. Well, you're not going to open to them. They can be around you, but you'll never open to them. You know, you are the one who constructs this universe that you live in. And you're going to construct the next one. You know, I'm working on my next one because this one's just about closing down. I got a few more years and then I'll be out of here and I'll have a new body down the road because I tend to come back very quickly. I, I don't take the whole hundred years out kind of thing that a lot of people take. But, uh, you know, so what do you want? What do you want for your next life? You know, you can think about that now and start constructing it. You can set those things in motion. You know, uh, it's, it's really our choice. Why would we leave it to someone else to choose for us? And yet, because of our childhood, a lot of us leave all kinds of things to someone else's choices. <laughs> you know, it, uh, it's up to us to take control. You know, when we take responsibility, a lot of people fear responsibility because responsibility is hard. It can be really hard. Why? Who do you blame when you are responsible? You have to blame yourself when you're responsible. <laughs> and it's so much easier to blame something out there. You know, it's the government, it's these kind of people, it's whatever. No, it's not, it's, it's, it's us. Yeah. Uh, so it looks like Julianne will probably get the last question or comment. Uh, it's just a comment um, mm -hmm. about when the, you hear the voice, uh, when the voice speaks, you, you respond immediately uh and if you don't it's at your own peril um <laughs> several i know you know what i'm oh yeah <laughs> saying. so several years ago and i think you know actually know this story um i'm awake at five o'clock in the morning apropos of nothing it's the middle of winter it's dark it's pouring I'm just up, I'm just getting a cup of coffee and the voice says, go now. And I go, what? Let me get dressed. No, go now, put your boots on. I'm in my bathroom and jammies. I put on my winter boots. I grab a jacket and some gloves because of course there's no heat in my old truck. 
And I proceed to drive 25 miles up an old logging road, which is flooded in, in parts. And I'm given directions as I'm going, because I don't know where exactly I'm going. But I, I figure out it's this person that I'm supposed to check on who lives off grid. I get there, I jump over this flooding creek, sort of. <laughs> and she's in the midst of having a stroke. Oh, wow. Wow. And I get this woman who's bigger than I am out the door of the cabin, across the creek and into my truck. And she's, she's lucid enough. So she's telling me, oh no, there's nothing wrong. I'm going home. And I said, oh, let's go do this. It takes me quite a long time, but I get her to urgent care in Rosebrook because she won't go to the emergency room. I sit her in the car and I say, wait here. I run in and say, go along with me. No matter what I say, what whatever she says, please go along with me because I think she's having a stroke. Please get her to the emergency room. And so I run back in, and they're looking at me like, lady, I'm still on my bathrobe and jammies, right? Hair are wild. <laughs> I go out in the car and I bring the lady in and she's, she's doing worse. She needs a wheelchair now. And they take one look at her and call the ambulance and, and get her to the emergency room. And then they put her on the plane to OHSU and she's in emergency surgery and her life is saved. But it was, and it was the only reason she was alive because I didn't talk back to the voice when I certainly would like to have. Nice, nice of you to share that. And God bless you for having listened. And that's what we all have to learn to do. I yeah. know, Michael, that our time is about up and I don't want to exceed that. So <laughs> I will okay. say thank you for giving me this honor. Well, and Michelle, thank you very much. Um, you know, your, uh, your, your commentary, your responses have been um, very eye-opening, you know, and I'm sure that we will be chewing on this for the week to come. <laughs> um, please check in with us next week, everybody, when we'll have Reverend Donna Smith here to talk about her service. And uh, thank you once again to Michelle, and I hope you all have a wonderful Sunday. Take care. Thank you, Michelle. Bye. Bye-bye.